convicted murderer, Graeme Dwyer, has won a significant legal battle in his attempt to have his conviction for murder overturned. Europe's top court confirmed this morning that Ireland's system of retaining and accessing mobile phone metadata breaches EU law. Such data was a key part of the prosecution's case against Dwyer in 2015 when he was convicted of the murder of Elaine O'Hara in August 2012. Well, joining me now is People Before Profit and Solidarity TD Mick Barry, Green Party TD Nasa Horrigan, Special Correspondent with the Irish Examiner Mick Clifford and Associate Professor of Law at Trinity College Dublin, Owen O'Dell. Um, to come to you first, Mick, and remind us of the key part that this um, mobile phone data played in the case and in the prosecution case against Graeme Dwyer for the murder of Elaine O'Hara. Yeah, I think some of the original evidence that was found was a mobile phone and they were able to connect uh, communication between Graeme Dwyer and Elaine O'Hara on a number of occasions and track the, where the phone was. Um, so it, it, it was a large part of the prosecution, but it wasn't the only part of the prosecution, but it certainly fed into the overall case. Yeah, and there were a lot of details given around text messages yeah. and all of that throughout the course of the trial as well. It would have, it would have, as you say, been be, be one of one of the key parts, I suppose, of of the case. Absolutely, as, as it has been for a number of prosecutions, particularly. Um, in some instances, uh, murder prosecutions like this, but as well, to a large extent, organised crime. A huge amount of prosecutions in relation to organised crime relies to, to either a greater or a lesser extent on telephonic uh, traffic. OK. Um, oh, Nadell, take us through this. This is being seen as a big legal win for Graeme Dwyer. Now that the European Court has confirmed its decision, it didn't come as a surprise, I think, to many who've, who've been looking at this case and watching what's happened over the years. How much is weighing in his favour now that the, the appeal is due to take place? Well, it's like um, it's the end of the first half of a football match and he's 1-0 up. And that's, that's about as good as it gets for him at the moment. There is still the entire second half to go. That is the Supreme Court decision when it comes back and then um, the extent to which he can rely on that to appeal his conviction uh, in the Court of Appeal and then perhaps the Supreme Court again and then perhaps even the Court of Justice again. So there's a whole other second half, extra time and maybe even penalties before this is decided. Now, it was interesting listening to Shona Murray there when I say what implications will this have in other European countries? Mm -hmm. She said, well, this has been played out and essentially has been case law since 2014. Yeah. But it's a big deal here today, isn't it? Because there hasn't been much action since 2014. Am I there, right? Absolutely. There has been, it seems, uh, significant and perhaps even deliberate inaction. The decision in 2014 was a decision taken by, uh, in a case taken by Digital Rights Ireland against the Irish data retention regime uh, and the Court of Justice struck down the underlying directive in 2014. So we have known since 2014 that there are at least questions to be asked. Um, we, we knew in 2016 when the Court of Justice reaffirmed it and it has reaffirmed it every Every year since. So that by the time it got to the Advocate General before Christmas and the court today, the Advocate General and the court were exasperated. Oh no, here we're being asked the same questions and we're giving the same answers again. Um, so it's been perfectly clear since 2014 there's a problem. It's been clear in Ireland at least since 2017 when Mr Justice Murray, the retired Chief Justice, published a report saying that there is a problem. The government published a bill at that stage which um, after pre-legislative scrutiny has just been gathering dust. OK, well, I want to ask you, NASA, about that. What, why is this the case? We knew back, about it back in 2014. It's been back and forth through the courts. Um, and now we've got this European court ruling that was all very expected. Um, but nothing's been done. No, I, and I think it's a fair comment. And we, we need to, to move ahead with that legislation now. I, I think that what has been useful is to get certainty around what's cir in what circumstances we can have targeted retention um, and where you can have perhaps a freeze on data um, and the retention. But I have to say, none of those domestic aspects, if, if and when we do implement them, would really have dealt with, with the Dwyer case in, in the way that we would want. Um, but I, I have to say that it's very hard to defend the fact that we haven't moved moved forward with that legislation and I think it's something that now we need to put pressure and I need to put pressure as a backbencher on the government to move ahead very quickly on. Is that a failing on, on behalf of the Department of Justice? I think what has happened is that we have pushed forward a huge amount of legislation in the last two years because of the public health um, pressures and um, a whole number of other legislative issues and it simply has been put wrongfully probably on the back burner. Ignored? Yes. Um, 
Mick Barry, what do you take from, from all of this? Clearly, it has highlighted the fact that the state have failed to act around this. But you'd wonder the implications it would have had for court cases over the years since then. Yeah, I, I think there's two points that I would like to make about this. Um, first of all, we, we have to remember the case that we're dealing with here, the killing of uh, Elaine O'Hara, uh, a brutal killing of a young woman, uh, one of 244 femicides that we've seen in this state in the last 25 years. Uh, and the idea that there can be any question mark uh, over the conviction because of the way that this case was handled is, it, it, it must be uh, extraordinarily difficult mm -hmm. uh, for her family and friends. And I think that's an important point to make. But in, in terms of where we are now, I mean, you asked the question, Claire, there, failings on the part of the, of the Department of Justice. The answer to that question is yes. I mean, for eight years now, uh, they have, uh, there has been inaction. And if they were taking a gamble that this case was going to break their way, well, surely that was, I'd be interested in hearing Owen's opinion, he's the legal expert, but it would seem to me that that was quite reckless, very reckless, mm. uh, in terms of the cases that have built up since that time and what might happen with them now. Yeah, uh, this is the big question about the implications for all cases. There, there has been a drop-off in, in the use of, of this, you know, mobile phone data retention in the past few years, hasn't there? So there has been some action that investigators aren't using it as much in cases in order to, to, to find prosecutions. Well, we don't know what other evidence there might have been in some of the cases uh, that Mick was talking about where uh, mobile phone uh, data retention was used. Um, we do know that in the... Um, uh, in the Dwyer case, there's a lot of other evidence as well. It was a two-month trial. There was a lot of evidence um, uh, that wasn't just the mobile phone uh, evidence. And in the uh, other cases at the moment that are pending, uh, the, the, the guards and the prosecution are relying on other evidence as well. So, yes, there is now beginning to be a recognition, but it's, it's a, a very belated recognition. Um, uh, whether it'll make any difference to Graeme Dwyer. I mean, it'll make it, 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 it could make a potential difference to other cases, certainly, where they won't use this mobile phone evidence now. But whether it'll make a, a difference to Graeme Dwyer, well, the Supreme Court will have to decide the basis on which the legislation is incompatible when it comes back to the Supreme Court. And that will then turn uh, or um, determine whether the evidence is admissible or inadmissible mm. in the appeal, in the criminal appeal. And Mick, we've, we've heard from Garthi on this, and, uh, who've said it is a key part of, of fighting crime is to have access to data such as this. Is this going to be a real problem for them? It'll be a certain problem, Claire. I mean, I was, I, I attended, the I think it was the first case where this kind of communication was used. That was, it was the murder trial of Joe O'Reilly back in about, 2007 and I, I still clearly remember being in that courtroom for the first two or three days and saying to myself the guards have very little on this guy at all and then suddenly they tracked a mobile phone from Fibsborough where he claimed to be up to the knoll where the murder had been committed and back down again and I can still recall the feeling inside in the room that day that you realise my god they have this guy you know, as far as I was concerned, there was no way he was going to get off after that. Now, that was the first one where it was used. It was used very successfully. Would he have been convicted without that? I don't know, but it was certainly a central plank of the whole thing. There have been a number of cases like that since then. As Owen says, you know, OK, perhaps there's other evidence that they didn't concentrate on much when they had access to this. But there's no doubt it has been serious dereliction of duty. I think that it has been prioritised over the last eight years and predicting that this fatal day would come, which puts the guards in an invidious position one way or the other.